Welcome, my friends, this beautiful place. Well, this morning, uh, I looked at my calendar, and I realized it's full moon today. So I thought it's quite appropriate uh, to talk about the heart. But tonight, I will speak mainly about the physical heart and about heart diseases. Well, heart diseases are, next to cancer, the most common medical conditions in the Western world. According to the scary statistics of this PBS, or quoted in this PBS program, heart disease now kills half of all Americans. One of the medical doctors who was interviewed during the program said the following. Our ideas of how heart attacks come about have evolved enormously in the last decade. But we haven't really completely unraveled the mystery of cardiovascular risk. Well, this reveals that the standard series of heart diseases and of heart attacks in particular are only based on ideas, on assumptions, and yet we, the public, are made to believe that these official explanations are founded on good science. Good science means that the established theories have been scientifically verified and are reproducible in each and every patient's case. But this is the standard theory which we have heard and read many times. So let's take a close look at that. Cholesterol plaque in the wall of a coronary artery block the blood and oxygen supply to the heart muscle causing a heart attack. So let's be aware of that what they're saying. They're saying that a cholesterol deposits in a coronary artery block the blood supply to the heart so there is less oxygen uh, supplied to the heart, which they say causes the heart attack. But this is not always the case. Since 1948, over a dozen reports of post-mortem uh, mortem examinations of infarcted hearts have consistently failed to corroborate the coronary artery obstruction theory of myocardial infarctions. That is, victims of fatal heart attacks have had no evidence whatsoever of coronary occlusion, stated by the World Research Foundation. Then there is the so-called risk factor theory, um, which uh, says that uh, if there are certain risk factors, that this enhances or increases the chance of having a heart attack. Risk factors such as smoking, a lack of exercise, a high-fat diet, being overweight, elevated cholesterol, high blood pressure, a family history of the disease, just to name the top of the list. But there are also the odd ones like this. Brush teeth to prevent heart disease. People who fail to brush their teeth twice a day are putting themselves at risk of heart disease, research suggests. But the risk factor theory is also full of contradictions because there are people that don't smoke, exercise regularly, eat healthy, are not overweight, brush their teeth twice a day, and still suffer a heart attack. And there are people that have an elevated cholesterol level and never have a heart attack. The same applies to high blood pressure. Concerning a family history of this disease, same thing. There are people who suffer heart attacks in spite of no history of heart diseases in the family. Well, one of the reasons, I would say the reason, why conventional medicine is unable to explain these inconsistencies is that mainstream medical research only pays attention to the organ level and to statistics. Observations that do not fit the norm and are outside of the preconceived parameters are 
and this is the point, are interpreted as the cause of a disease. So concerning uh, the heart attack theory, observe the observation that cholesterol plaque um, uh, are, or that cholesterol plaques are in the coronary artery, that is correct. That is a fact. That is verifiable. But to conclude that these cholesterol plaque cause a heart disease, that is an interpretation. And this is when scientific theories turn into narratives and into academic fiction. Well, in 1979, Dr. Rieke Gerd Hammer began to investigate the cause of diseases and of heart uh, diseases uh, in particular by uh, looking beyond the organ level. Based on the premise that all bodily processes are controlled from the brain, Dr. Hammer analyzed thousands of brain scans of patients with all kinds of diseases, with different types of cancers, muscle disorders, skin disorders, diabetes, arthritis, and so forth. And he made a startling discovery. By comparing his patients' brain scans with their medical <coughs> assessments, he found that every disease has its own area in the brain from where the disease was controlled. Concerning heart diseases, he found that every patient who had suffered a heart attack showed, without exceptions, very distinct changes on the right side of the brain in the so-called cerebral cortex. The exact changes, for example, a wide ring configuration, as we see here uh, in the, on this brain scan, uh, so these exact changes were determined, so he found, by the magnitude of the heart attack that had taken place. Well, next to the brain, Dr. Hammer also took into account the psyche. So our emotions and the emotional and mental level in general. By exploring his patient's personal history, he quickly learned that all of them, without exception, had suffered what we call in German New Medicine a conflict shock. For example, the loss of a loved one or an unexpected separation or a loss of a job, of a workplace and so forth. And by systematically comparing his uh, patient's medical assessments with the brain scans and the conflict shock they had experienced, he recognized that the psyche, the brain, and the correlating organ were three components of a biological unit that always works in synchronicity. So always works as a unit. And this is how Dr. Hammer formulated his findings. He says, the differentiation between the psyche, the brain, and the body is purely academic. In reality, they are one. So, and within this unit, the psyche is now the uh, realm or level where the conflict is experienced. The brain is the part that registers the shock, and as the mediator between the psyche and the body signals the conflict message, so to speak, to the corresponding organ. This, in turn, initiates a pre-programmed process of generating either cell proliferation or cell loss. And Dr. Hammer found, and this is the foundation of the new medicine, that this cell loss or cell proliferation is not uh, a, a malfunction or the result of a malfunction of an organ, but instead a pre-programmed response to, that serves to facilitate a conflict resolution. So, for example... If a person suffers a death fright, the lung cells will immediately start to multiply and to proliferate in order to supply the organism with more oxygen. 
And if this conflict is intense and lasts over a longer period of time, this ongoing cell proliferation will form a lung tumor or lung cancer, assumed by conventional medicine to be a malignant disease. But Dr. Hammer turns this paradigm entirely on its head by, by demonstrating that diseases are in reality significant biological special programs created to assist an organism during unexpected distress. And firmly anchored in the science of embryology, Dr. Hammer's research shows that the brain and every cell of the human body is encoded with age-old survival programs, with survival programs we humans share with all living organisms. Because like all living beings, we also suffer separation conflicts from a mate or from an offspring, or nest worry conflicts when we worry about the well-being of a loved one, or territorial conflicts when the safety of our domain is, in, is uh, uh, threatened, or death fright when um, our life is in danger. And it is this biological conflict experience that connects us with all life. And this is why Dr. Hammer calls his findings biological laws. So the five biological laws of the new medicine explain the cause and the nature of diseases, including their cause, based not on a theory, but on biological principles that apply to every human being and therefore to each patient's case. Can't get better than that. So I'm going to, before we go to our special topic, to the heart attack and heart diseases, I'm going to very briefly summarize the five biological laws so that we are all, as we say in English, on the same page. Okay. And I'm going to use, uh, for the explanation of the five laws, the biolog biological compass of German new medicine. Well, the first biological law states that every disease originates from a conflict shock that occurs simultaneously in the psyche, the brain, and the corresponding organ. So a conflict shock is, in German New Medicine terms, an emotionally distressing event that occurs entirely unexpected. So it is a situation for which we are not prepared and which we could not anticipate. Right? So unexpected. It gets us on the wrong foot, so to speak. Dr. Hammer termed this conflict shock a DHS, or Dirk Hammer syndrome, in honor of his son Dirk, whose tragic death in 1978 was the reason why Dr. Hammer himself had developed cancer, and, and as we know, this is what actually initiated his research. Next point, subjective because such a conflict shock is naturally a very subjective experience. One and the same conflict, for example, an unexpected divorce, can be experienced by one person as a separation conflict and by others as a loss conflict or an abandonment conflict or a self-devaluation conflict or an anger conflict and so forth. Uh, how we individually experience such a conflict is, con is determined by our very own individual reality. So by our social and cultural conditioning, uh, by our attitude, by our expectations, by our vulnerabilities, by our fears, and so forth. Such a conflict shock is not only subjective as far as how we experience it, but also the intensity of the conflict experience is very subjective. So for one person, the one and the same conflict can be experienced by one person as highly traumatic and by another person on a more subtle level. But in any case, 
the moment a, uh, uh, the association with a very specific conflict theme is established, the conflict-related biological special program is instantly set into motion. So this takes us to the second biological law, which states that every significant biological program, you see we don't use the term disease anymore, so every biological program runs in two phases provided there is a resolution to the conflict. So at the moment of the DHS, at the moment of the DHS, the entire organism enters the conflict active phase. And during the first phase of the biological program, our autonomous nervous system is in lasting sympathicotonia, that means in a lasting or prolonged state of stress. So typical signs of conflict activity are therefore restlessness, nervousness, compulsive thinking about the conflict, and sleeping difficulties. We have all been there many times, right? But there is a reason for that, because the extra waking hours and the total focus on the conflict allow us to find a resolution to the conflict as soon as possible. Well, the conflict active phase is also the cold phase, because when we are stressed or doing stress, the blood vessels are constricted, and this is why we have cold hands when we are conflict active. So all cold symptoms, for example, the shivers or cold sweats, only occur during the conflict active phase. CL stands for conflictolysis, which basically means the resolution of the conflict. So with the resolution of the conflict, the entire organism switches now into the healing phase. So during the second phase of the biological program, uh, the autonomous nervous system is now in lasting vagotonia, which is a prolonged state of rest. And this is why we are very tired when we are healing. And the healing phase is called now the warm phase because uh, during the healing phase in Vagotonia, our blood vessels are now widened, so now we have warm hands. So all warm symptoms, for example, fever or inflammation, therefore only occur during the healing phase. So we can go to the third biological law. The third biological law refers to the ontogenetic system of tumors and cancer equivalent diseases. All this to say, the term ontogenetic refers to the embryonic development of the fetus. The term cancer equivalent refers to all diseases that are not cancer. Yet, the principles of all biological special programs is the same. And this is now but I'm going to explain the third biological law in a nutshell. All organs that are controlled from the old brain generate during the conflict active phase cell augmentation. So the old brain, that is the brain stem and the cerebellum. So all organs and tissue that are controlled, tissues that are controlled from the old brain generate during the conflict active phase cell augmentation. On the other hand, all uh, organs that are controlled from the new brain, that is the cerebral medulla and the cerebral cortex is basically the cerebrum. So these organs generate during the conflict act active phase not cell proliferation, but do the opposite. They cause cell loss, meaningful cell loss. Uh, here we find, for example, as far as cell augmentation is concerned, uh, cancers of the lungs, of the liver, of the prostate, of the uterus. And as far as cell loss is concerned, here we find, for example, osteoporosis, we find uh, stomach ulcers, and so forth. The moment the conflict is resolved, everything is reversed. Now the entire organism enters the healing phase. 
and the additional cells now during the healing phase that multiplied or that proliferated during the conflict active phase. So these additional cells that are now no longer required are now removed and broken down. Whereas cell loss that occurred during the conflict active phase is now refilled and replenished with new cells. And this restoration process is assisted by microbes, by bacteria and fungi, for example. And Dr. Hammer formulates and summarizes the beneficial role of microbes in the fourth biological law. So activated from the brain, fungi like candida fungi or bacteria like tubercular bacteria, staphylococcus bacteria, streptococcus bacteria and others. So these fungi and bacteria assist now the restoration process. They help to reconstruct the tissue in order to restore the organ to its normal function. And now, my friends, during the healing phase, now we're seeing symptoms. For example, swelling, because healing always occurs in a fluid environment, so we'll, there will be an edema at the site. And this edema causes swelling. The swelling, in turn, causes pain. Then we typically see inflammation because there's more blood flow to the healing area, to the healing tissue. We have fever because we are in the warm phase when we are healing. And night sweats are very typical. And discharge. Because discharge has the purpose, or is the idea of the discharge, is to eliminate the byproducts of the uh, healing process. The discharge it can be mixed with blood because these small capillaries, these small blood vessels, uh, break easily uh, due to the swelling. And all these symptoms, so swelling, pain, inflammation, fever, discharge, are also typical for an infection. But as we now learn to understand, particularly based on the fourth biological law and the beneficial role of microbes, infections are not caused by microbes, but microbes play instead a vital role in the healing process of an organ. Okay, so we go now to the fifth law, which we have already basically summarized. This is the uh, quintessence, basically, of the new medicine, which is, and we can't hear it often enough, every disease is part of a, so either active phase or healing phase, a significant biological special program created to assist and not to destroy, created to assist an organism during unexpected distress. Okay? And with this in mind, we'll go to the heart. And we're going to start with the heart itself. Well, the heart consists of four heart chambers that are divided by the septum. So we can speak of a right and of the left of a left side of the heart. In order to understand why the heart is divided into two halves, we have to understand and learn how the heart developed during the course of evolution. Well, originally, when um, um, life existed only in the ocean, during the fish period, so to speak, the heart consisted of two tubes, with one tube carrying oxygen-rich blood from the gills to the organ, and the other tube carrying oxygen-depleted ba uh, blood back to the gills. And the heart of fish still works this way. So, but during the period when life moved on land, the lungs developed, which allowed that oxygen could now be taken from the air instead of from water. 
this is basically the time when gill breathing was replaced with lung breathing. And now something significant took place. In order to make room for the newly developing lungs, the heart tubes twisted around 180 uh, degrees. And this is why the right atrium and the right ventricle are in the human heart on the left side and the left and the um, uh, ventricle and left atrium are on the right side. The myocardium is a muscle that uh, rhythmically contracts in order to pump blood into every part, into every cell of the human body. So let's look very close to that. The heart muscle consists of 10% smooth muscles and 90% striated muscles. The smooth musculature of the heart is the older tissue. So in embryological terms, the smooth muscles uh, derive from the endoderm, which is the oldest embryonic germ layer. And like all organs and tissues that derive from the endoderm, the smooth muscles are therefore controlled from the oldest part of the brain, in this case from the midbrain that is part of the brainstem. The striated musculature of the heart is the younger tissue type. It therefore derives from a younger germ layer, namely the new mesoderm. And the strided musculature of the heart has two control centers. The, the uh, heart tissue itself is controlled from the so-called cerebral medulla, while the pumping motion of the heart is controlled from the motor cortex, which is part of the cerebrum. So let's look further. The coronary arteries and the coronary veins, these are blood vessels that la run along, uh, in, in, along the inside of the wall of the heart. The uh, coronary arteries and coronary veins, so these main blood vessels, are also endowed with smooth muscles. And just like the smooth muscles of the intestine push food along the intestinal canal in a peristaltic move movement, the smooth muscles in the coronary vessels move blood along the heart vessel in a wave-like peristaltic motion. The uh, wall, so the inner lining of the coronary vessels are lined with a cell layer that consists of squamous epithelium. And squamous epithelium is the youngest tissue type. Being the youngest tissue type, this cell layer uh, derives from the youngest germ layer, which is the ectoderm, and is therefore controlled from the youngest part of the brain, which is the cerebral cortex. And the coronary arteries are controlled from the right side of the cerebral cortex, just above the right ear. And the coronary veins are controlled from the left side of the cerebral cortex, just above the left ear. So what we are learning here, and this is, uh, I always like to emphasize this part so we see how Dr. Hammer ties everything together and particularly anchors his work in how the human body, how the human organism developed over time. So we can see that the oldest germ layer, they developed the oldest and first tissues and are therefore controlled from the oldest part of the brain. So we do have a system. So concerning the heart, what we're learning here is the myocardium, so the heart muscles, and the coronary vessels developed at different times during evolution, derived from different embryonic germ layers, are controlled from different parts of the brain, and therefore, as we will learn, relate to different type of heart attacks and are linked, therefore, to different biological conflicts. So now we have the system, and now we can go into the details, and we're going to start with the coronary arteries. <laughs>